Welcome everyone, good afternoon or good morning depending on which time zone you are in. Uh, today uh, Katya and myself will be presenting the Innovation Envy uh, story in this webinar. Uh, it is a story uh, where we will inspire you and try to tell uh, on what incumbents can learn from successful uh, disruptors. So I will do the first part and then we're going to hand over to uh, Katya. And what I would like to start with is a story or an example or a case of what I still consider a great um, example of an innovation from an uh, incumbent, which is the Swiffer. Um, Swiffer, uh, fun fact, actually was launched first in Belgium in 2001. Um, what a lot of people don't know is that the foundation or the origin of the Swiffer actually already existed in 1994. So that was seven years before the launch, um, uh, where smart researchers like, uh, like us uh, actually observed that when um, people were cleaning uh, the floor, they were actually spending half of the time cleaning the floor and half of the time cleaning the utensil that they were using to clean uh, the floor. So that was their, let's say, disruptive um, insight, which then gave birth to the idea of Swiffer. Uh, it took seven years. Uh, all the ideation, concepting, patent, uh, go to market took um, uh, seven years, uh, which is a long time. Uh, especially knowing that in Japan, uh, four years before the launch of Swiffer, there was already uh, the cow, which is uh, something that looks very similar to the Swiffer, also electrostatic um, uh, cleaner. Um, I personally wonder, in today's reality, with all the acceleration and the speed of how um, new uh, innovations are coming to market, whether uh, the Swiffer would have still been launched uh, successfully, knowing that this might have been, uh, let's say, the disruptor uh, of the market uh, back then. Just a Thought, um, and also indicating that the speed of change is so much higher now than back uh, in the 90s uh, and in the nillies and so we are uh, we are definitely evolving uh, there now I'm going to show you a video uh, with uh, let's say um, actually it's a commercial of one of those uh, successful uh, disruptors uh, that we will be talking about hi I'm Mike founder of dollarshaveclub.com what is dollarshaveclub.com well for a dollar a month we send high quality razors right to your door. Yeah, a dollar. Are the blades any good? No. Our blades are f***ing great. Each razor has stainless steel blades and aloe vera lubricating strip and a pivot head. It's so gentle a toddler could use it. And do you like spending $20 a month on brand name razors? 19 go to Roger Federer. I'm good at tennis. And do you think your razor needs a vibrating handle, a flashlight, a back scratcher, and ten blades? Your handsome ass grandfather had one blade and polio. Looking good, pop up! Stop paying for shave tech you don't need. And stop forgetting to buy your blades every month. Alejandro and I are going to ship them right to you. We're not just selling razors, we're also making new jobs. Alejandro, what were you doing last month? Not working. What are you doing now? Working. I'm no Vanderbilt, but this train makes hay. So stop forgetting to buy your blades every month and start deciding where you're going to stack all those dollar bills I'm saving you. We are DollarShaveClub.com, and the party is on. So starring in this commercial is Michael Dubin, the founder of Dollar Shave Club. Um, why are we using this uh, example? Because it shows uh, also the origin of where successful disruption, uh, disruptions uh, come from. Uh, in this case, it was Michael Dubin, who is a consumer of, uh, let's say, razor blades. Um, and he was uh, fed up. He was a little bit sick with a couple of things uh, that related to purchasing uh, razors. It was the price. Uh, he felt like he was paying a lot uh, for, uh, for what was considered a commodity. Uh, he also felt like shopping for razors was a, quite an adventure. Uh, you have uh, to find a, a clerk that to help you to open those gates, almost the fortress, uh, before you can actually buy a razor blade. So both in terms of perceived value for money and the actual buying experience, um, he actually wanted to uh, change uh, the world. And he, he had that friction, he had that tension, and that was for him the base to start. Uh, he registered the domain dollarshaveclub.com um, a couple of months later, and then it took him not too long uh, to then uh, launch with for a budget of $4,500, this commercial that you just saw, where he starred himself um, on uh, YouTube, and which was uh, the start of a very successful uh, launch. 
The rest of the rest is uh, history. And today, Dollar Shave Club has 16% of the unit sales of razors um, in uh, the United States. So talking about a successful disruption, disruption and just also bringing it back to the origin, how uh, simple it came uh, about uh, from, uh, let's say, trying to address a tension uh, that he was confronted with um, uh, day to day. Um, more and more companies are, let's say, realizing that it doesn't take a lot of time to be disrupted. And there is new entrants in the category coming in and eating away uh, market share. And there is even, um, uh, let's say, uh, guidebooks, handbooks on how to build your own uh, business uh, in, in just a, a short time and with limited budget. And this, I think, is a great example of a book, uh, Build Your Own Beverage Empire. Um, and two, uh, let's say, conclusions that they come to in the book is, um, a little bit of a quiz that I want to share with you is just how short it takes, how uh, fast you can actually launch a new beverage uh, into the market if you have a, a great idea. Uh, so just these are uh, three options. I'm just trying to capture capture your uh, mental uh, initial response. Um, uh, but just to share that it's only 39 uh, days. Huh? So that's very short for anyone who can actually come into your category and start uh, disrupting you. And it also only takes as little as 60 thousand uh, dollars. Uh, so that is the reality today. There is uh, a lot of, uh, let's say, new entrants coming into your category faster and fiercer. And that is also how Elaine from Denon, uh, our client Denon says it. She says these, let's say, disruptors, these startups are the David to our Goliath. Uh, so the, the, we are, as incumbents, uh, are often vulnerable because we do not have that speed. We do not have that agility, um, uh, to, let's say, to launch equally successful uh, innovations uh, in the market. And so that is the, that is the, the starting point and, and the reality today. When that happens, there is a couple of options. Well, if those disruptors uh, are for sale and you have enough money and you are the highest bidder, um, then you can actually decide uh, to buy them. In this case, Dollar Shave Club was purchased um, by Unilever. Um, so Michael Dubin received a billion dollars uh, for his uh, uh, for his company. Um, uh, with that, Unilever did not only just gain access in, uh, let's say, to a strong player within the category, they also uh, gained access to, a, a, let's say, a subscription-based uh, business model um, in a category in the categories that they were uh, playing in. So a very, very high value, a very high price paid for, uh, let's say, what, just uh, the turnover that it uh, that it generated. Um, there is Mars, uh, who purchased Kind Snacks, one of those brands that was actually hurting them, uh, let's say, in, uh, in, in hurting their category. And this is an amazing brand uh, with ingredients that you can see and pronounce um, and playing on the trend of naturalness. So Mars, traditionally in, uh, let's say, the, the candy bar uh, business and, and confectionery, uh, acquired uh, this brand. Another uh, great example uh, is IKEA that purchased, uh, let's say, a marketplace um, uh, where you could actually go and advertise household chores. And I, if I, for example, wanted to assemble uh, IKEA furniture, I wanted to repair a leak, I go on uh, TaskRabbit and then I uh, find someone in my neighborhood that wants to do that chore for a price that we agree upon. Uh, this was not only, let's say, a direct link with, uh, let's say, one of those most advertised services on the platform, uh, which is uh, assembling IKEA furniture. IKEA also purchased a lot of, let's say, data from millennials and what they were doing in their homes, what are the chores that they are paying money for, um, and so on and so on. So together, again, with the marketplace, they also bought a lot of knowledge of one of their, uh, let's say, core demographic uh, targets. Um, and then, of course, there is the king or the queen of acquisitions, uh, Google, that since the start in 2001 already acquired 218 um, uh, companies. And so that is definitely a company that has it in its DNA to just uh, buy, uh, let's say, successful uh, disruptors and startups uh, in the market. Well, if that doesn't work, buying them, then there is also uh, uh, what we would call borrow and steal uh, smartly uh, initiatives. Uh, this is uh, the whole birth of the age, uh, the age of agile. Um, uh, let's say this this book of, uh, of of Denning, but a lot of literature and consulting pieces have been written on, let's say, uh, the the, the the striving for more agile uh, innovation. Uh, this is, uh, let's say, initiatives that are popping up like mushrooms today in organizations is like 
here with Fidelity, where they have the internal incubators and innovation labs. Uh, we have the bootcamp, uh, the innovation bootcamp for uh, ING. We have the Hack Week uh, for Zalando. All initiatives that probably sound familiar uh, to in each of your uh, companies. And so these are the buzzwords. It's all about design thinking, Scrum, Agile, Hackathons, Minimum Viable Product. And so this is the reality. These are a lot of the buzzwords that we are confronted with day to day uh, in our uh, in our reality in our business uh, realities. Um, wh what we would like to add is to say, well, it's all about Scrum, but there is also a big Scrum but, uh, meaning that 70% of all these initiatives that you just saw, just some examples of all these Scrum Agile initiatives fail uh, within organizations. The main reason that is highlighted for the failure is that what you're able to do is you speed up a certain part of your process, of your innovation process, um, maybe within a silo of your business, but then you actually have to, um, uh, let's say, embed those practices again in the traditional structures. And you end up going again into stage gate. So you might have, let's say, sped up uh, as part of the process, but then you again are confronted with uh, bottlenecks. And to avoid that scrum butt um, uh, uh, syndrome, uh, what we're going to present today is actually how can we become more like them? And so what are the things that we can do? And especially, uh, let's say, entering from, um, let's say, uh, consumer-centric initiatives and consumer research and innovation research, what are the things that we can do as incumbents to become more like those successful disruptors that are actually hurting us um, every day and entering our uh, market and our category? So that is, um, let's say, the structure of our uh, story today is built around the three DNA elements of successful uh, disruptors that we have um, identified. The first one is friction. Uh, remember, Michael Dubin had a personal uh, uh, friction. How can we replicate that? Uh, the power of a friction in our innovation uh, process? Um, Katja will elaborate more on that. Um, then there is the whole aspect of passion. Now, this is everything that has to do with concept curation. How do we get from that insight to an actual um, uh, prototype and to, uh, to an actual uh, launch? And then there is everything that has to do with piloting. How do we build and, uh, let's say, create more gut in our business to start piloting earlier on and to capture early user uh, uh, feedback if possible? And so those are the three chapters. And I'm going to hand over to Katja for the mm -hmm. first one. Yes, thank you, Philip. So the first DNA characteristic is friction and it boils down to when you look at those startups or those successful uh, disruptors, what you see is what they all have in common is that they start with this tension, this friction, this hunch that the founder or the initiator experiences for which a solution is absent. And it's this single friction, and, and you could say it's an insight, this mono insight that drives them to explore the solution space. And what is really defining that is that it's not only strong and unique, but it is it becomes literally embedded in everything that they do. And this is in fact the foundation of the whole uh, product and, and service creation uh, process. And it's the start of innovation. And, and Philip also mentioned it. It's also what you see with the example of uh, Dollar Shave Club, where Michael Do Dubin, he experienced this friction, this tension that buying razor blades is not only a very challenging and demanding experience where you have to locate uh, the uh, razor blades, then you have to do mental, uh, you could say, uh, thought exercise where you have to decide which razor blades features uh, you want to buy, uh, how many blades uh, and so on. And then you have to locate a staff member to open that fortress to then eventually having to pay uh, too much money for a simple concept being a blade and uh, a stick uh, to hold the blade. And this is also what you see with uh, the example of, of Goddess Garden. I'm not sure if you're familiar with Goddess Garden, but Goddess Garden is uh, a company uh, providing or you, you could say manufacturing uh, skincare and uh, sunscreen uh, products natural all natural and it was uh, founded by Nova Covington uh, the person you can see on the slide behind me and uh, she uh, 
she had a baby girl, Paige, who is now an all grown up, as you can see here. And her uh, baby was allergic or showing allergic reactions to all uh, synthetic ingredients. And so she didn't find any uh, skincare and baby care products. So she, it became her quest, literally, to uh, to solve that friction and solve that problem. And it's also the quote, what she quotes on on the slide here. I started my company as a way to solve a problem, and so it became the basis of her whole skincare line, which is now sold in twenty five thousand retailer points in the U S. and um, in Canada, including Walmart. So here, what with these examples, what we're trying to show is that an inside of friction becomes really is, is driving innovation success. However, embedding insights in your organization is not only driving uh, innovation success, but also business success in general. And especially when you look at it in terms of revenue growth, because uh, these are some figures from a research uh, insights 2020 report by Kanta who conducted uh, plus 300 in-depth interviews and also 10,000 interviews with uh, marketing and executives. Uh, and what they saw is that uh, comparing underperforming and overperforming companies in terms of revenue growth, they saw that when you look at it, um, 51% of overperforming uh, companies, insights are really leading their business, while this is only 13% for the underperforming uh, companies. So insights are a core to uh, business and driving business decisions and also finding the right insights as such and those frictions and those tensions is an important facet when starting your innovation funnel. However, unlike those you could say founders and those startups, you working for a company, uh, you might not be your target consumer and you might not experience that friction and uh, that tension yourself. So generating insights being a very important step, uh, you could say, is about really going to the real place. And this things back to Gemba, uh, a, a Japanese business uh, philosophy, where you really have to immerse in the consumer reality and in the consumer context to really understand what does those frictions and those tensions and those insights that you can use and tap into to drive the innovation uh, process. Now, this is obviously where research comes in and it can be as simple as uh, conducting a, a diary task. Uh, if we're looking back at the shaving example, it's a daily habit and it could be something like asking your um, consumers to describe their uh, shaving ritual uh, uh, explicitly in words, uploading pictures, movies on how uh, they uh, do their shaving routine in the morning and this might uh, uh, this might bring back the most apparent insights and frictions that are there, but also analyzing those movies, you can also find those underlying frictions that might become a basis for uh, the whole ideation uh, process. But today's technology goes beyond that or allows to go beyond that. And I would like to challenge you uh, for a moment. Well, not really challenge you, but um, I'm sure there must be a smartphone near you. And uh, because this is not an very interactive format being in a webinar I do want to uh, bring in some interactivity and I want to invite you to take out your smartphone and go to YouTube and in the YouTube search bar I would like you to type in Thomas Troch 360 um, Thomas Troch by the way is uh, our colleague he lives in New York uh, he works for a New York office and if you go to that movie uh, what you will see is you will literally immerse in one of the most you could say private rooms of Thomas's uh, apartment uh, his bathroom and uh, when you take your smartphone it allows you to really go through his bathroom in a 360 view and see Thomas uh, brushing his teeth uh, you can uh, literally have a look at what products he use if he uh, wets his 
his toothbrush uh, before brushing his teeth, what toothpaste he uses, the amount of toothpaste and so on. So you can see uh, and I want to really encourage you to have a, a look, a peek and you can literally immerse in a, a simple habit and in a, in, in, in a private space you could say uh, because of today's technology uh, and, and allowing you to understand those and, and find those frictions and those insights. Another example is um, a project we've done uh, for Durell. Uh, Durell is a manufacturer of uh, juvenile strollers and I will show you uh, a short video. When the wind blows through the window and the sun goes down all over the city with their Queenie brand they really wanted to understand what are the friction of millennial parents living in the city uh, so young people who are uh, who enjoy the urban life and then their family situation stays and so how can they become relevant for them and one of the insights that uh, came out of this research is the following one I'm not sure if you can read this uh, but it says, I love my city and I believe in the opportunities it offers for my child's development. However, having a child has forced me to rediscover my city from a different perspective. And something as simple as going out of the front door becomes a challenge in terms of mobility. And so you see this mobility challenge here. And this is what we define as an insight. And an insight, I would say, is a very buzzing word, insight an outsider industry. Uh, it's a, one of the most used words, uh, also uh, overused, misused and even abused words. But what is an insight exactly? I'm not going to tap into to that into detail, but important to note is that an insight is, is not an idea, it's not a hypothesis and an insight, how we define it, has three key components. An insight needs to be relevant, it needs to trigger uh, personal identification or peer identification. A second one, it needs to have this uh -huh, this freshness, a new perspective, a new way of looking at things. And then <coughs> it should also have some emotional valence. There should be a drive for to explore uh, that solution space. And so based on that, you could say, uh, mobility challenge and that insight, uh, um, Quinny the, developed one of a, a, an out-of-the-box ID or concept and that was the longboard strolling uh, stroller allowing young urban millennial dads to discover the city in a fun uh, way a very out-of-the-box ID that is not on the market however if you look at Quinny's website today uh, they do have a simulator there allowing you as a young parent uh, to indicate uh, the size of your living space uh, also the times or uh, the frequency of your use of public transportation and also your urban lifestyle and because of that uh, based on those parameters the simulator will guide you to your perfect uh, stroller that matches your urban uh, DNA. Now 
generating insights is uh, a must you could say however uh, it can be something as a checkbox that you want to get as many insights as possible i mentioned in the beginning what defines you could say the strength of those startups is that they have this one single core strong insight this mono insight so uh, even when you did research and you generated insights it's important to understand what is the core insight to focus on for your innovation for your concept phase uh, uh, because one insight can be the platform of many ideas many concepts and 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 many executions so a very important step during this process, once you gather, gather those insights, is to uh, prioritize and select those insights that are strong and have the most potential uh, for uh, the future innovation uh, process, you could say, and to start ideating. And this is also a common practice that we do uh, with Heineken, for example, where we test their insights. And what we see there uh, doing a meta-analysis on all those insights there is that Concepts that are based on a validated insights perform 40 times better than those uh, in terms of unpriced buying intention uh, in terms uh, uh, compared to those uh, without. So it's about not only generating but prioritizing your insights. And then once you have that core insights that you want to take further in your innovation funnel, um, you cannot just simply lock it up on your company server or somewhere in your mind. It's really about um, activating that insights throughout the organization. Innovation is the responsibility of the whole organization. And so that insight, that friction, also considering that your company employees are not your target consumers, it's important to activate those insights and make your consumers, uh, make your employees experience those insights, feel those insights, and go beyond just recognizing those insights. And I'm going to show you another movie of a company who really wanted to uh, make that uh, connect, you could say, uh, their employees uh, with uh, their consumers' uh, frictions and needs. Uh, and it's Van der Velde. It's a Belgian um, uh, manufacturing company in uh, lingerie products. De vraag die vaak terugkomt is, hoe kun jij nu als man weten wat het is om een grote cupmaat te dragen? Je maakt lingerie voor een grote cupmaat, maar je weet niet waarover het gaat. En we hebben een ongelooflijke race aan marketingtechnieken om dat te kunnen. Maar er is maar één manier om als man te beseffen wat het is om een e-cup te dragen. En dat is een e-cup dragen. Daarom lanceren wij de internationale E-Cup Day voor mannen. Ik krijg vaak te horen, ja dat moet leuk werken zijn met al die modellen, die posters van halfnaakte vrouwen. Maar ik kan u zeggen, mannen staan er niet stil bij wat het betekent om een e te dragen. Mannen kijken misschien graag naar een e-cup, maar dat is niet de essentie van een lingeriebedrijf. Mannen zien er alleen maar het aangename van. Want zo'n e-cup, laten we duidelijk zijn, dat kan toch een kilo tot anderhalve kilo wegen per borst. En dat is niet weinig. Dat doet pijn in de nek, dat doet pijn aan de rug. Ja, dat is een mooie strijd, hè. Dat is echt een oh. Wees maar eens die vrouw. Draag die borsten maar eens de hele dag met je mee. Dus daarvoor heb je een goede ondersteuning nodig. Door een goede BH voelt een vrouw zich niet alleen fysiek beter, ze voelt zich gewoon aantrekkelijk. Een goede ondersteuning is belangrijk. Iedereen bij Prima Donna weet dat. Yes, I, I'm sorry for those. Uh, it was in Dutch. I hope you could uh, get uh, a look at the subtitles or that you understood. But uh, what the message here is at Prima Donna, what they did, uh, they uh, they uh, provide uh, or they make manufacture lingerie uh, for um, women with uh, bigger breast sizes. And so their men for one day had to carry around the weight, which is about one and a half kilograms per breast uh, for the whole working day. Uh, for them to realize what it is and how important giving support is. And it, it might be a funny uh, campaign or action within the company, however, it does 
uh, is uh, thus shown to be a great initiative to close the gap between your employee and your uh, consumer. And uh, it can be as simple as just confronting your employees with your uh, consumer. And this is, a, for example, a project that we did uh, together with Unilever. Uh, it was for sustainability and and there we gave this same you could say task or challenge to uh, the employees and to consumers and it was to upload a picture uh, from their fridge and um, tell talk a bit about what you could find in their fridge and you could see a clear gap you could uh, you could say between what uh, employees would upload or, or the fridges of the employees and those of the consumer because what you saw is employees their fridges especially considering that they're all uh, within the sustainability or working within a sustainability project it was all with glass containers minimizing waste uh, leftovers uh, leftovers were stocked up for uh, the next day for lunch and then when you looked at the consumer side it was like uh, we just put everything in there when we're having leftovers we just put them in the fridge because I feel bad throwing it out now however I know that I'll be throwing it out in a couple of days and sometimes I just find stuff hidden in the back of the fridge um, so a clear mismatch which just by showing and confronting your employees it shows you what those frictions are what those insights are to then uh, take it further and it's about activating insights through consumer connect because you can ask yourself how many of the employees working in your uh, organization have actually met a consumer talked to a consumer and it can be as simple as online in initiatives where you chat with consumers but also offline uh, initiatives where your R&D your marketing team uh, your CMI team literally meets a consumer talks with the consumer to then really understand what are those frictions those tensions those insights that can fuel uh, potential innovation uh, so this is the first DNA characteristic. Uh, it's about friction, uh, generating insights, validating them, and also activating them throughout your organization. And now Philip will introduce the second uh, DNA characteristic. Yep, so now we're going to go into the second DNA element, which is uh, passion. So we assume now that we have a short list or at least one, uh, let's say, mono insight uh, to start from, uh, to start our ideation and concepting process. What this is all about, this is even if you have a great uh, idea, um, it, is, it also is about passion, it's about execution, and that is something that you cannot steal. Ideas can be stolen, but not that passion and uh, execution. So I want to center this little chapter around three observations almost that we see um, in all the innovation projects that we are doing uh, for our clients. If there is one metaphor that I would have to use for getting from an insight to a market launch, um, it is often a relay race. And there is a stage gate where um, ideas are handed over uh, to another department, concepts are written, concepts are handed over to R&D uh, to build prototypes. So there is this relay race um, uh, that, uh, that is happening linked to more traditional stage gate uh, processes. What we see often is that this was a, a, a beautiful gold button. Often we also see, um, and this is maybe a little bit strong, but garbage passed on from the one uh, to the other. And so we feel the curation of concepts. Also just the skill of being able to write a concept um, uh, within an organization is, uh, is often uh, lacking. Um, uh, personally, we believe that a concept is not only there to test with consumers. A concept is also something that is there to align internally. Are we really aligned on all the details and all the aspects of this uh, concept with uh, concepts with all the people uh, within the team and within uh, the organization? Um, that is why the discipline of concept writing and, and, and taking your time and effort and skill um, and train the necessary skill to do that is for us uh, super crucial. Um, uh, to develop the right uh, concept. A second aspect is uh, what also uh, this smart uh, person from Lego uh, understood is uh, that he says that 99.9% .9 of the smartest people in the world don't work for our company. That is true for Lego. I think it's true for all the companies in the world and I also believe it's a a major understatement. I think um, we have to be able to tap into, let's say, people outside of our organization to develop um, uh, better uh, innovation. Um, let's uh, go back to the example of Nova, yeah, the founder of Goddess Garden. She also realized, well, I have this friction, I might have a great idea, but I don't have the skills to actually 
um, uh, develop, uh, uh, develop a new formula. Um, she was lucky enough to have a husband that was a nutritional scientist, so that is where she brought in, let's say, an expert into, um, into the process. Um, we really believe, and that is also based on a Forrester uh, research um, that, that exists, is where you look at a hundred random people on this planet, there is 90 that we would call mere spectators. Those are the people that could validate, uh, let's say, our concepts, but that have no real, uh, let's say, uh, they, they cannot really help you create or curate um, uh, concepts. Then there is the nine people uh, that actually are able to curate concepts, take the right decisions, prioritize, uh, let's say, the good uh, from the bad, move on, uh, write uh, the concepts. So those are the curators, which is, let's say, in reality, it's you and your, uh, and your consultants uh, and your agencies that will have to make the decisions to help curate uh, that funnel. And there is that 1% uh, that is actually able uh, to create. Um, in more and more our, of our innovation projects, once we have the insight, we actually tap into that 1%. And uh, we have a partner for that, which is ICA, which we are also uh, proud uh, now to call uh, a member of the Insights uh, family since uh, last week, um, where we use them uh, at certain stages of the innovation process, where we need that outside-in perspective, where we need some more expertise and creativity to think um, out of the box. It is a, a practice that is more and more adopted among, uh, let's say, uh, different organizations. Um, it actually started in crowdsourcing for content creation. And I think we all remember, let's say, the Super Bowl halftime, uh, let's say, commercial of Doritos, where actually PepsiCo uh, sent out a challenge to the market and, and to consumers to say, look, um, please send in your commercials and we will select uh, the winner. And we will, uh, the winner gets not only a million dollars, also gets aired in, uh, let's say, prime time, uh, uh, let's say, uh, commercial uh, airtime. Um, so that is where it originates from. More and more companies are tapping into, let's say, creative crowds and crowdsourcing um, uh, vendors like an ICA um, uh, for product um, uh, ideation. And these are some examples. There is, um, uh, let's say, Oral B that tapped into the creative crowd to learn what is possible. Uh, imagine that the toothbrush is connected. What could be all smart features and benefits and use cases uh, for, uh, let's say, using a connected uh, toothbrush? Uh, we also have an example of Doritos, uh, where it's all about, let's say, their millennial target. They are stimulation junkies. They are all about building and offering new experiences to their consumers and, uh, and customers. This is an idea that, as you can see here, that came out of the creative crowd, um, even with the design of the packaging with a name already. The idea was almost like a Russian roulette. Now, so you have a bag of Doritos. One of them contained either, let's say, a blue uh, a squid ink uh, so that your uh, mouth would turn, um, uh, let's say, blue, or one would be extremely uh, spicy. And this was also the foundation, almost literally uh, copy pasted into an actual uh, product that was launched uh, in the market. And so, just to show the power of, uh, let's say, um, crowdsourcing initiatives uh, in today's innovation process. The third point that I wanted to make in this uh, in, uh, around passion is we remember the time pressure that is on us. Huh? Because if we have a great idea, we have to bring it to market fast and faster um, uh, because there will be uh, companies out there that are uh, trying to launch, uh, let's say, something uh, similar. And this is where we are, uh, let's say, observing often a long fuzzy front end. And so there is this phase where we generate insights, where we start, uh, let's say, ideating, um, iterating uh, concepts. It takes a long time. And then at the end, there is what we call the traffic light syndrome and the benchmark fever, where all these things need to be validated in order to uh, proceed to the next um, uh, stage gate. We don't believe that model is future proof and is not really, let's say, the way to innovate. And if we would uh, draw it, uh, it is actually at the speed of a bobsleigh, you actually go on a highway and you have small traffic lights installed over time. And so it's about validating much earlier on in your innovation process, all the way at the insights, as Katja um, uh, presented earlier. Um, uh, so we need to build in more evaluation moments um, uh, to, to be able to diverge, but also converge throughout the concept curation uh, phase. Uh, and here are some examples. Now, one example is um, Serial Partners. Uh, they came in 2017 from a process with a lot of, uh, let's say, a long fuzzy front end and then a validation um, at the end uh, of the year um, and uh, of 30 concepts. Um, in that year, uh, this is the score that they achieved. So they had 
four three star ideas and one um, uh, four three star ideas and one four, four star uh, idea. For a category under pressure like cereal, um, that is not really good. Uh, that is not really reassuring that this is the funnel that you're going to rely on for the next year in terms of not only the quantity but also the quality of the concepts that you have generated uh, over year. So cereal partners came to us and they said, look, uh, Insights, we are looking for uh, ways to do innovation faster and better. Uh, so we need to get from insight to concept, not only in a much radical shorter time frame, we also need to develop uh, uh, better concepts. So with iterations of insight generation, insight validation, um, co-creation and ID screening and all, let's say, a sequence of activities, we were able in a, in a period of just six months to generate five three-star ideas, seven four-star ideas and one five-star idea. And so this is showing not only the impact on speed, but also in the quality of the concepts uh, that you deliver. Another case is for um, ABI, where they do every year an iWeek. It is the innovation week. It is, uh, it is really high time uh, because all the, uh, let's say, 50 to 60 executives fly over to a, uh, to a central location. And that is almost like a pressure cooker for, let's say, the, uh, for uh, feeding the innovation funnel for the next, um, uh, for the next period. Um, how do we help them? It's actually in bringing the consumer into, the, into that initiative. It is a very agile, um, uh, let's say, practice to, to do a lot in a week and to do a lot of work in one week in terms of, let's say, preparing concepts uh, uh, for the innovation funnel um, uh, but it also requires some consumer work and how we bring that in is in um, in three ways one is in on day one we actually bring in the insight and we bring to life the insight and the tensions and and category opportunities through consumer uh, let's say debriefs and we, we not only present um, uh, let's say the results we also allow um, uh, executives to interact uh, with consumers then on day two there is the whole ideation uh, phase um, where this year we also uh, actually introduced ICA as the crowdsourcing um, uh, solution to bring more inspiration in that phase and to already bring in more out of the box um, uh, ideas uh, at that point uh, in the process. Where we also do overnight ID screening. And so in day three, when we then gonna work with a shortlist, instead of doing the internal exercise of putting stickers on um, ideas and concepts, we actually uh, also integrated consumer feedback. So overnight, we were not only uh, let's say presenting the results of the internal voting uh, with the people within the workshop, uh, but also we could confront that, uh, let's say, with the scores of, let's say, what the consumers uh, came up with uh, overnight. Uh, quite reassuring. Um, and then, so that is what I describe now as the process of going from an insight to a, a strong uh, a concept in uh, less time and with uh, better uh, quality concepts. So now we're going to hand over back to Katja for the pilot. Phase. Yes, so the last DNA characteristic is pilot and it is closely linked to what Philip just mentioned, the need for iteration and validation and also having some pilot mentality and some gut feel and this is really typically what you see amongst those startups um, because if you look at uh, on the other uh, side to those incumbents what you see is that they're often characterized by a stage gate uh, procedure where there is a validation overdrive what we call traffic light syndrome benchmark fever and okay you need those uh, timely checks and those validation along the way. However, removing all the risk is a risk on its own. And an example of a company who failed uh, to that extent and, and because of trying to remove all the risk and creating a perfect product is uh, Microsoft with their Zune. I'm not sure if you're familiar with the Zune. I was one of the few owners, I think, uh, of the Zune, but the Zune was uh, Microsoft, you could say, a product to counter the iPod. Um, however, it was launched five years after the iPod came out on the market. So in a market where people were using already music players, were used to the iTunes, uh, Microsoft launched the Zune. It was a very good product, very user friendly. However, it wasn't very different from the iPod. And, and so because they wanted to create that perfection, they came too late with a product that was just a Me Too product. And this is also what uh, Microsoft um, said afterwards we were just 
uh, not brave enough and so this is also what you see it's all about trying to pilot and and not chasing that perfection because perfection is the enemy of uh, process and looking at those traffic light it also means that you need to uh, dare to go through an orange light you or you could say a flickering light that just tells you go ahead but with cautious uh, just just do it jump into it because even if you're launching your product, and this is a quote uh, from uh, Dieter de Kuning from Danone, even when you launch it, it's not finished and that's where it actually all starts. So launching your product and going in market is actually the starting point. And this is also what you see when you look at those startups and those in, in uh, successful disruptors. They don't have uh, this perfect product and they don't consider market launch as the finish, uh, finish line however their approach is really a launch and learn approach where they learn uh, they 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 take information from the market from consumers and they optimize along the way and this is also what you see with uh, Kova uh, Novington uh, Nova Covington she said I think a large part of my success has been paying attention to what people really wanted and needed and uh, learning from other moms goddess garden grew up at the boulders farmers market market and it was because of feedback and and changing things along the way that now she is she has her products in uh, 25,000 retailer points where once she was just on uh, a, a small stand on uh, a farmers market and what it shows is or what can we learn from this as incumbents is that we need to consider our go-to market as part of your innovation so not waiting for the perfect product to launch and having all those checks in place and all those traffic lights green but it's about launching just one flavor or launching something at the subset of the market and really uh, when it's launched learning and optimizing along the way and an example of a project uh, that we did for uh, pepsico is uh, the one for uh, drinkfinity uh, drinkfinity is uh, their new beverage you could say concept where it comes with a vessel uh, so there you would put your water in and different pots and the pots they have both dry and and uh, liquid ingredients uh, with different flavors but also uh, beneficial uh, um, in ingredients giving you energy and so on and the concept is that you uh, fill up your vessel with water you put a pot you choose a pot with a flavor or a beneficial ingredient you click the pot and then you have flavored water with all uh, the energy that you need to go through uh, the day this was a product that was uh, launched already in the Brazilian market however they wanted to launch it in the US market and before and but they wanted to know what was the ideal price the communication plan the whole uh, go-to-market aspect and what they did is they uh, beta tested uh, the product uh, amongst their employees because uh, PepsiCo has 60,000 people working uh, from for them and so uh, they invited uh, through an intake survey, they selected 3,000 uh, beta testers who could test the product and uh, based on seven uh, follow-up surveys, the price was set, the communication plan was set and the whole rollout was uh, defined. Another example is uh, what a project we done for Veet. Uh, Veet had this new technology uh, and they wanted to uh, understand if there was, was something, a product that they could tap into. And so they uh, ran a, a, a square a community uh, in the German market where uh, they wanted to know how consumers, women would use this new technology and this new product and by uploading pictures and, and their routine and using, trying this product and really with unboxing videos they could see how they could then optimize the product for a full uh, launch and the whole go to market aspects um, looking at the quote back from uh, Dieter de Koenig who said it's uh, launching a product is uh, not the finish line they have uh, at Danone they have uh, this innovation acceleration program and part of this program is uh, rather than testing new flavors and new concepts in closed lab environments they uh, work with uh, 
pop-up stores in the streets, uh, in this case of London. Uh, this is was for their new uh, uh, breakfast concept AM, uh, which is a protein-rich uh, uh, breakfast uh, um, um, uh, bowl you could say and there they tested it on the you could say on the streets of uh, London for three uh, weeks but it could also uh, be uh, beta testing and and, 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 and and connecting with users to know when to stop and to go back and not launch your product or not launch it in another subset of the market. And this is something that uh, Fleur did. Uh, Fleur, I'm not sure you're familiar with the brand, but they have, um, they're have they actually uh, leading when it comes to um, um, heating cameras and the technology. Uh, and the they had this technology where you could have this uh, heating camera and you could attach it to your phone and you could uh, look around and see in your home where you are losing heat and where you could potentially improve your home. A very interesting proposition that worked well with uh, professional builders, people working in construction, uh, architects. However, they wanted to know uh, whether it would be interesting to also sell their product to um, to regular consumers and so uh, we did a community uh, beta testing community where consumers could uh, test this new technology and uh, see what <coughs> to understand what are the use cases and also how they could optimize the uh, the app in terms of uh, user friendliness and what you see there is that uh, the learnings were that uh, it's a very interesting technology but when it comes to consumers or the end consumer it's a one-off uh, use you use it to detect your home then you fix your home where uh, heat is leaking uh, but that's that and so it's also about uh, understanding and learning where you should go but also where you should not be heading to and uh, this is a great example of there and so to summarize in the end it's about detect fast and acting faster because uh, innovation is a damn hard thing uh, I think uh, if you look at the numbers 50% of all market launches, they uh, disappear after uh, a couple of year, uh, years. Uh, they also uh, did a research on retail, uh, what the products that you can find at the retailers. And of those, f less than 40% are still on the shelves after three years. So it's really pretty hard and it's about optimizing, learning along the way. Uh, and also uh, you could say every day is D-Day. Uh, it's a day that you need to take hard decisions and big decisions and also a day for letting go and also accepting, you could say, failure and, and making tough decisions on closing, you could say, a product or stopping somewhere around, along the innovation uh, funnel. And uh, I think Google, master of not only innovating, buying uh, uh, companies, but also a master of being uh, uh, hard and, and saying, no, uh, this product, we, we stop uh, with that. There is even a, a website killed by Google with uh, the cemetery for all Google products, which no longer exists. Uh, amongst those, the Google Glasses, of course. Uh, but I think it really shows you could also see it as positive and embracing a philosophy and this lounge and learn mentality. Uh, Philip will wrap up uh, okay. what we just discussed. Thank you, Katja. Uh, so these were indeed the three DNA elements, yeah, each built uh, around a chapter. Um, and we try to bring it to life with, let's say, um, initiatives and activities and capabilities that you can bring into an incumbent organization to become more uh, like and successful uh, disruptors. So this is how the framework actually looks like. And we can share that afterwards if you want. So this is, and, and it's actually too small to read, but on, on purpose, this is just a sequence of, let's say, types of research, workshops, crowdsourcing initiatives that you can do uh, actually all the way uh, through these uh, three phases of your uh, innovation process. Um, what we also wanted to clarify before closing is that this is a framework and it looks heavy. It is also a lot. If you really do each of these steps, it still will take uh, quite some time, although we, we have a lot of uh, efficiency and time gains already with, with, with the capabilities that are on the market today. Um, uh, but still, uh, it also is not necessary that you go through that 
their whole face. Uh, so the Dorel case that we showed uh, with, let's say, uh, addressing the opportunity with urban uh, millennial parents uh, in, around the world, that was a very strategic, high strat uh, strategy uh, project. So there they actually ticked all the boxes. They actually went through the different phase and it was a quite uh, lengthy uh, process. In other cases, um, uh, we, it's much shorter. You come in in a certain cycle or you already have a product like uh, Drinkfinity. It is already a product. It already existed. It has proven its success. We already know who the target group is. We already have quite a lot of the concept uh, there. We just need to finalize the go-to market. So this is the, the third uh, use case or the third scenario where you come in very late um, into the process and you go immediately into um, um, a beta market. One example that we can um, end with is, uh, let's say, um, a, a post hoc inciting. It's something that we sometimes do for clients. Yeah, we have a technology or we have a solution or there is a solution in B2B that we want to create a value uh, proposition for consumers around, uh, a bit like the FLIR. Um, uh, so that is where you have an existing product, you actually allow people to experience it and then you try to actually uh, see if there is any tension that we're solving. Is there an insight underlying um, uh, that we can actually build a, a, a successful concept uh, around? And so just to show that Every use case, even within one company, there is different uh, innovation uh, scenarios and different ways how to use these different capabilities along the process. So this was uh, our story. This was Innovation Envy. Um, we actually decided that a Q&A is not so, uh, also we don't have the time uh, for it anymore. And we actually like to address your questions uh, personally. So if you drop an email with your question or with, let's say, a, a request for clarification, please send it to, um, um, Katja and myself, and then we can uh, we can reply to you uh, as soon as possible. And maybe also a small note: you can download uh, the full book scene, so the story we brought here today with the different cases uh, on our website. Uh, so have a look there. Uh, there are also more book scenes available if you're interested in, in the other stuff that we're doing here. Uh, but again, if you have any questions, we would like to address them personally. Uh, just uh, send them either to marketing at insightsconsulting.com or you can contact us directly uh, by email and we would ha be happy to answer any questions that you might have. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Have, have a, a good day. Bye-bye.